good thank you very much and um, actually i'm not talking unfortunately about very fast things actually just the opposite i talk about something which is stable stable in time but it doesn't mean that it cannot be changed fast and uh, so it should give you more a kind of idea which can may also apply in optics and with fast magnetization and with fast magnetization reversal but it's a it's a principle i think which can be applied in both the uh, say technology of memories so having really long storage but also in the possibility of switching very very fast and the work i'm presenting are actually the work of these two people here, two PhD students, João Gordino, Gordino, who is presently a PhD student in Prague, and uh, Bradip Kumarut, who is, was also in Prague, and he's now in Regensburg, and uh, João will come to Regensburg, and we start building up a small group together there, and hopefully still a lot in collaboration with Prague. So you see all these people here, they are all from Prague. And then there are some additional people here, which are actually from the University of Chemnitz, as a technical university, and the Helmholtz Centrum in Dresden. The group of Olaf Helwig. There are some materials there. From, from, from there, I got some materials which we will discuss here. Okay, good. So we heard about all the merits of, of antiferromagnets a, lo a lot, especially the focus on this fast dynamics. My focus will be a bit on the detection of antiferromagnet because if you do very fast switching and fast reversal, you always also have to find it and to have uh, to observe it and to observe it if possible fast. And this is something which is not so simple in antiferromagnets because intrinsically antiferromagnets are well, they don't have large net moments and uh, yeah, they are a little bit invisible in a sense. So the talk will be about. Um, those detection and the detection also well that's it okay so um this problem okay so detection here you have this <laughs> this uh this picture okay you have the possibility to imagine an antiferromagnet very simple like this and may you be able to resolve this uh, uh, on the atomic scale but if you look in macroscopic dimension those two states are in principle identical even from the physics point of view many transport quantities are identical so one quant uh, transport quantity in the electrical but also the optical regime so the anisotropic magnetoresistance or the linear dichroism this is in principle impossible to distinguish those states what you can distinguish are these 90 degree states which Camille was talking in the morning all these figures he showed were actually linear dichroism measurements where you can distinguish uh, domains with uh, dominantly uh, nail ordering 90 degree rotated well in this uh, cover manganese arsenide the material heavily used in Prague and uh, a material which actually shows this anisotropic magnetoresistance effect and even enables the rotation by electrical means of the of the nail vector using um, the staggered spin orbit fields and the corresponding torque when applying a current so you have in those kind of cross structures they can be more simplified but in principle they have to be cross structures you can apply large pulses to reset the uh, magnetization and uh, the, the ordering and sorry and you can use a probe pulse in principle to detect the anisotropic magnetoresistance in this case in a transverse uh, okay in a, in a transverse geometry and we also seen those very nice pictures from Camille that well you can either shutter big domains in very small domains and uh, this gives the functionality of the system, which allows you to make a kind of counter. So as much as pulses you apply, as stronger the overall change in your uh, magnetic transport. And uh, this gave ideas of, this is not possible to use maybe those kind of antiferromagnetic systems for neural computing because synapses could be in a sense be mimicked by those kind of devices. 
right? And we also seen in principle, one can use very short laser pulses. We don't know so much about the dynamic, how fast the process is, but it's possible to switch those states or to make those counters as it is shown here in this picture. Also from Camille's work. So these grayish areas here are where laser pulses are applied, short term to second pulses. The white areas, nothing is applied. And interestingly, if the pulses is off, what you can see, the signal decreases again, right? And they are, well, it's not really understood. The Kami was pointing out this question a lot. What could be actually the origin of this? Is it that those small domains re-establish bigger domains? Is it because of magnetostriction? Yeah, magnetism, the magnetic order might be somehow related to a magnetostrictive thing and the system tries to equalize again to a 50-50 distribution of domains. All those things are not really clear. However, there is decay. Or maybe also your anisotopy, because this requires a biaxial anisotopy if you switch them by 90 degree, is not really biaxial. So you have maybe a dominant uniaxial anisotopy. So what about the electrical and also optical detection of those states, of really antiferromagnetic reversed states? Can you distinguish them? Obviously, the anisotropic resistance effect, as we understand them, is not able to do this. There is what you know, the anomalous Hall effect. Obviously, anomalous Hall effect is, um, uh, is changing its sign. It uh, has a you know, time reversal symmetry. And in some particular uh, antiferromagnetic materials and those more complex structures, Helen was speaking about, uh, these non-collinear antiferromagnets, they indeed show uh, anomalous Hall effect, which is related to the orientation. And if you switch, uh, switch all the, the spins by 180 degree, indeed, you will see a change of this anomalous Hall effect. Now, anomalous Hall effect, as I said, is odd under time reversal. So if you look back to our copper manganese arsenide, we have these two sublattices. Indeed, because one of the sublattices, the copper atoms are above, and the other sublattice, the copper atoms are below, you can, in principle, when you switch the time, to distinguish those sublattices. So you have a broken time reversal symmetry. So, yes, is there anomalous Hall effect, maybe even in the copper manganese arsenide? Actually, well, it has another symmetry broken. And this is when you do now the inversion symmetry, the space inversion symmetry, when you exchange in principle x set y with minus x minus y and minus z, then you see that you also change in a sense the two subsatuses a and b. Together, you have in principle in this material system a combined pt symmetry. P is broken, t is broken, but the combination of both is there. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it depends on how you see it. This avoids that you have an anomalous Hall effect because this time reversal symmetry makes it somehow in this system necessary that your anomalous Hall signal should change uh, under this PT symmetry operations, not. But on the other hand, <coughs> the electric uh, space inversion flips both the electric field and the current, time reversal only the current. So this should be also a solution. Of, of this system. So the only solution, in fact, is that there is no anomalous Hall effect, unfortunately. But let's go back to our magnetoresistance. And the magnetoresistance may have also higher terms. So what you do actually, you, this, you change your, you disturb your system by an electric field, or in this case, it's written by a current, and you look to the change of the disturption with the current. So a second order response. And indeed, this kind of system yeah, has, <clears throat> has a broken time reversal symmetry. So this effect can be in principle present. And it has also a PT symmetry, which is allowing this equation. <clears throat> so the PT symmetry makes it actually uh, allows it or makes it possible that there is this second order magnetoresistance effect present. And interestingly, this PT symmetry is nothing very special, but many of the antiferromagnetic lattices, point group lattices, are actually have this uh, uh, PT symmetry. So it's something which is actually quite common. Good. So the most simple system, 
you can imagine, is actually a synthetic antiferromagnet. And why we're using now this is because we've seen all this mess today. There are the domains we don't really understand, there are defects and all this. So it's very difficult really to see those effects present in real antiferromagnets. I will show you that they are also present in real antiferromagnets, but I will start with this synthetic antiferromagnet where you have two ferromagnetic layers, right? So your sub are now replaced by two identical uh, ferromagnetic layers which are coupled by an exchange layer, antiferromagnetically coupled by the rkk -Y interaction. Unfortunately, this rkk -Y interaction is not very strong. Therefore, all the frequencies we are talking are not in the terahertz regime. They are still in the gigahertz regime. But um, we understand the physics as well there. It's just much slower, much easier exp exp experimentally to track. And as you see, you have a PT symmetry because you have the same metal layer on top non-magnetic metal layer on top and on the bottom. So this indeed the system has a PT symmetry and the broken time reversal symmetry. So in a sense, it's a model of our couple manganese arsenide, right? This is a real uh, layer now, platinum on top and on bottom and uh, cobalt are the ferromagnetic layers which are antiferromagnetically coupled via a erythium layer and the anisotopy, and this is important here, is out of the plane, perpendicular to the plane. So when we look to our anomalous hall effect, as we know from the copper manganese arsenide, uh, of course, you see anomalous hall effect if you really apply a strong magnetic field. So then you are above the spin flip field. So you polarize both layers in the same direction by applying an out of plane field. And then you see a hall signal, anomalous hall signal, and you see it at a positive strong field. Then they are both parallel and again generate your anomalous hall signal. But between them, you can't really distinguish those two states. Then you can also think, well, it looks a bit like a GMR, right? A giant magneto resistance device, you have two layers and GMR, obviously you have a reference layer and the free layer and with respect to each other, you can distinguish again, if they are parallel, they are in the low energy state. If they are anti-parallel, they are in the high energy state again, you can't distinguish anymore. So our normal magnetotransport does not allow us to tell us anything about this state. What will tell us is actually our higher <coughs> order transport. Well, one thing is, and it's because it's a real system and it's not just a perfect antiferromagnet. As you can see, when you do those experiments, you have a small inner hysteresis. The hysteresis means that one of the layers switches at a slightly higher field than the other one, which means one is the master and one is the slave. I think Cairo likes this, I think. And uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so one, but that, that does it mean is that you can, in principle, polarize your system uh, well in this direction. And when you then go, Sorry. When you when you when you move with your magnetic field, you go to a zero and to positive, and in this range now it switches to an antiferromagnetic state, which is distinct because we have started on the left side. But if you start on the right side, it's just opposite. Right? If you know what you did before, you can in principle figure out what state it is, but you cannot measure. But this preparation may be useful to show that our higher uh, order uh, magnetotransport effect. And also the optical equivalence, right? It's not only just what I say now, it's measured electrically, but it can in principle, of course, also measured optically. <clears throat> so this is now um, this, I call it nonlinear magnetoresistance effect, second order magnetoresistance effect. And this nonlinear magnetoresistance effect is proportional to the perturbation. So proportional to the spin orbit torque. And of course, the spin orbit torque will change at opposite uh, direction of your nail vector. Yeah, this is actually important. Now, what you need as well is a magnetotransport, which is sensitive to this change. So say this d theta is actually the change you introduce by your current. So unfortunately, we have a perpendicular to plane system. This means it is just an extrema. So your magnetotransport will not know if it moves to the left or to the right. But you can make a little trick 
and you make uh, another perturbation. So you perturbate the perturbation. Yeah. And uh, so with a small perturbation, what you can do here, for example, you can do other things, but this, what we did here, is to apply a small magnetic field, which is entirely in the plane, which will give us no information about the spin, but it will slightly tilt our magnetic moments. Obviously, it breaks this PT symmetry, but nevertheless, it then works because our dmr, d theta, is not anymore zero around the equivalent points. And this you can see here. So we apply a field in the plane, and this field is now uh, shown here. And when you set up your system, and you can set it up because you know you have your little disturbances here, if you come from here or from here, what does your second harmonic signal do? Doing? Look for one state. As soon as you have the perturbation on, it goes up. And for the opposite state, it goes down. And if you change this, the orientation of your perturbation, you see just the opposite. Wonderful. Very nice. So in principle, we can, in a regime where you normally can't distinguish the orientation, you can now distinguish your antiferromagnetic state simply by a non-linear magnetoresistance effect. And this um, non-linear magnetoresistance effect is actually generated by um, Stuckert, the Stuckert component of a spin orbit field. So again, it's very important. You will only modify or perturbate your system uh, when you apply, if it's small, your perturbation, the orientation of this effective spin orbit field in a staggered way that to each of the sub lattices, the orientation is just opposite. And this is happening actually when you apply this uh, in-plane field to our anti-damping, you have two components in that direction, which are staggered and the component uh, of the anti-damping in a uh, y direction are actually parallel. So importantly here to see is uh, the two x direction would be parallel. So what actually acts on the anti-ferromagnet? It's a staggered contribution of the anti-damping field, and moreover, uh, anti-damping field for the uh, it's in principle anti-damping. You can the torque is m cross m cross the polarization, right? And the polarization is opposite in our, on our system on both sides because you have a platinum on top and a platinum below, so inverted thing. And P cross M is our field, and therefore it is a staggered for this Z component out of plane field. Now, um, we can use, therefore, this field also to switch the orientation because it's uh, along that direction or along that direction if you change current direction the staggered field goes in the opposite direction and therefore we can switch between the two states <clears throat> in order to facilitate the energy barrier yeah you apply also an in-plane field if you have no field like your energy barrier is very high it's the anisotropy barrier it's of the order of uh, tesla also in field in units of the field uh, if you apply now perfectly an in-plane field perpendicular to the anisotropy axis, you reduce your anisotropy up to the point where you come to the spin flip field, then these two minimas merge and become only one minima. Yeah? But you want to be still stable and you want to switch between those stable states, so you have to reduce it because your spin orbit torque field is also small. Right, okay, so we go usually to a field which saturates it, put it in a certain direction, and then go to a, a field where we slightly um, uh, reduce this energy barrier. But on the other hand, by starting with this out of plane field here, we know when we switch the out of plane field to zero, we have a defined uh, state, which now we can look, can we switch it electrically? If you measure our second harmonic signal, we start indeed here. Yeah. And uh, now we apply a pulse. Say this pulse, this is a device. Right. This is indeed the real device which we measured of the order of 10 micrometer. We send the pulse for this structure. And what happens is <coughs> nothing. We see the signal behaving like we seen before when it was polarized in this state. If we apply at the same conditions, the opposite pulse, the signal has changed and we have switched by spin orbit torque to the opposite direction. We can do the same thing with the setting up the polarization with our uh, out of plane field in the opposite direction. And again, 
you see the same thing. Just now, you switch at the positive current, you switch and at the negative current, you don't switch anymore. So you can switch indeed your antiferromagnet simply by spin over torque. And now, interestingly, if you compare the size of the signal, here we have fully polarized our whole structure and we have about one milli ohm of signal. Indeed, the torque has switched the whole structure throughout. Is it the only possibility? Actually, it's not. Because what we can do, we can now say, well, these antiferromagnets are extremely interesting because we can do this stable, multiple, uh, we can do this multiple states, right, switching. And indeed, we can do here the same. What I show you here is a setting up of the system by spin orbit torque, all in different states. Those are always accumulation of about 20 individual measurements. So that's why you see a couple of points on top of each other. But this gives you also an idea about the, uh, the error. You have to take also into account the error of the, of the measurement precision. But you see, you can in principle have many multiple states in the simple uh, synthetic antiferromagnet, which just contains two cobalt layers antiferromagnetically coupled. And there, your normal response, your normal first harmonics XX, right, also now measured very precisely in milliohm remains all the time constant, no change at all. So there is really no effect you can measure in your first harmonic. It comes only when measuring a second harmonic, which corresponds to the nonlinear response. Okay. And what's even more surprising is that you have extremely long uh, retention times. So what you can show here, you can set up your system and you switch it, say, to state one. You can switch it to state uh, minus one just uh, to have a kind of reference defined, and then you switch it to an intermediate state, back to one, and then to emit intermediate state, say, this is minus 0.3. Yeah? And this state you have now generated by having a barrier of a given height by the application of an in-plane magnetic field. Now you switch off even this magnetic field. So you say, okay, I want to keep my information in my system, which I store, and wait, now having a huge energy barrier between the two states for about an hour. And then I apply again my field in order to be able to measure, I have to break symmetry, and indeed I will find exactly the same point back. So it has remember the state, one hour, and just as a reference, I switch again, fully polarized in one direction, fully polarized in the other direction. So we have a device, very simple, only two ferromagnetic layers, antiferromagnetically coupled, which enables us to memorize intermediate steps over extremely long time constants. So maybe indeed a memory state device. Okay, this was a synthetic antiferromagnet. Very simple, but shows it works. Here now we have our real antiferromagnet, which is copper manganese arsenide. Same system has a broken T and P <laughs> uh, symmetry, but a combined PT symmetry. And indeed, if we do very similar experiment, looking for the reversed antiferromagnetic state, we can do this switching quite often and we will find exactly always the response to the reversed magnetic states. And if we look to the time, how long we can set such a state, if we apply a pulse in one direction, it's for one day in one night. And then we apply another pulse. And again, the state remains there for one day, for one night. A real memory, right? And this is now a real copper manganese arsenide. Now, this, is this, uh, positive, is this uh, motion or this reversal, can it be fast? Yes, of course it can. Well, first of all, how you can see it, because there is copper manganese arsenide, which has uniaxlan is thought to be. So only two, uh, domains are able, which are have a reversed NEL vector. And between them, you see those snakes, which are actually um, domain walls, 180 degree domain walls, <coughs> which are um, yeah, defining the boundary between those two antiferromagnetic reverse domains. And you see the problem with our first harmonics <laughs> of our linear response here in the optics there's no difference between them. You cannot distinguish. 
you know here that the domains the orientation rotates so you see a contrast in your linear dichroism this is a linear dichroism measured uh, for x rays in such a, a huge uh, light source and well um, now we have such a system 180 degree they actually nail type of domain walls and uh, here the magnetization rotates that's why you see it and I propose you here another type of detection method, which is based on a thermal detection. Here you use not an electrical detection, but a thermal detection. And why we use this thing? Because what you need here in order to do this image is a huge synchrotron, right? Where you have to ask for beam times and you may get it or you not get it. And uh, what we have here is simply a near field microscope, which is misused, a scattering near field microscope, by generating actually a small radial symmetric heat gradient in this dire direction and this heat gradient uh, I have no time anymore okay then I just show you the result the result is that you have a lot of domains in the structures which are actually measured now by this new method and more interestingly if you send current pulses so this is the uh, uh, magnitude this is the intensity and these black lines are the domain walls and if you send a current through the structure, now we come to the speed. This actually, we spoke about the fastest thing is the Lama precession of antiferromagnet. Here we have this Lama precession of antiferromagnet, but also moving in space. So a domain wall is, if you want, nothing but the precession of the magnetization in time and in space, which gives you speeds as long as this domain wall is stable of velocities of close to the magnon velocity. And here, what we can do with our experiment, we can send pulses. And you see that those domains increase one type, the red one increases, the blue one, no, the blue one increases, the red one decreases. Oh no, the red one now increases and the blue one decreases. So you can repeat this many times. It looks exactly like you would do with a ferromagnet when you apply a field. So this is a field like force, which is actually the relevant one. So some domains will shrink, some domains become larger at the same current direction. So this is the way of reversal, which we observe with this method, which Thomas was actually talking about when he introduced my talk. Okay, so uh, summary. <laughs> what I showed you is a 180 degree spin reversal and antiferromagnet is possible. And you can detect mm -hmm. it uh, via the spin orbit torques, which here done in, by just by sending electrical currents. But of course, you can think about shape pulses, elect, uh, elect, electromagnetic pulses, optical pulses, and the terahertz machine possible in systems where you have a PT symmetry. So <clears throat> in principle, I showed you writing and reading of stable non-volatile multi-domain states and uh, also potentially ultra fast 180 degree switching by spin orbit torque driven domain wall motion. And yeah, and this uh, scanning high resolution magneto CBEC microscopy uh, is the effect which we explore here, the, the, the magneto CBEC effect in an antiferno magnet which enables you to see magnetic domain walls, not the domains themselves, but the domain walls. And yeah, that's, it's, that's it. Thank you very much.